All right. Good evening. We're meeting with Kenise Barnes, and she's the owner-director of the Eponymous Gallery. Somebody introduced me that way, and I had to look it up. Um, how I'm fascinated. How did you, what when you were a little kid? What was your relation? A little kid, you know? Uh, no, not that little. Fifth grade. What was your uh, relationship with art? So I guess uh, I grew up thinking that um, being an artist was actually a profession, which was a gift, I think. My father's great uncle was um, a painter who studied with Remington and is sort of well known. And so we had his paintings in my house. They were paintings of Indians and of the American West, but still this kind of romantic notion that he traveled you know, out to the D Dakota territories and made paintings and uh, he also wrote and um, you know, chronicled his, his time with the Indians and you know, I was inspired. So I made my mother um, take me to buy art supplies and we weren't wealthy, so at some point, you know, I was make, using them up, you know, constantly looking through, uh, you know, using up sketchbooks and watercolor paper and what, whatnot. And, you know, she finally kind of put, a, put her foot down and said, you know, if you're really an artist, like you're really an artist, you can make art with anything on anything. And I was, you know, flummoxed by that because I just wanted to go to the art supply store. It's the coolest place ever to visit. Yeah, um, but I was stuck, you know, in the backyard. She said, you know, go, go. She also had another expression, you know, that if you had a good mind, you could never be bored. So there I was, you know, yeah, accused of, if I complained, I had, I was a bad mind. So. Where, were, where was this? Uh, I grew up in a small town outside of Syracuse called Skinny Atlas, New York. Okay. It's um, near the Finger Lakes, central New York. So then you didn't become an artist. I went to art school. To become an artist. To become an artist, yeah. Um, so I first started out, so I was, you know, kind of the art room kid in my high school, okay. which didn't have a great art room. You know, now, like, the, the uh, I have children. The school that my children went to had incredible supplies. You know, they had a, a printing press and kilns. We had none of that. We had sort of um, newsprint paper, and I guess we had some, um, we did some linoleum cuts. I was probably as exotic as it got. But I spent a lot of time in the art room and, um, you know, graduated with that class artist title and, you know, got to do the prom sets, things like that, so we got to do. And um, went to a small school for, to be a fine art major. And then after that, it was a two-year college. And then I went after that to a fine art university. And I stayed for a year and a half and a uh, year and a half, or maybe even finished that second year. Anyway, I, I left, I had a, um, I dropped out. And um, after a drawing critique with my favorite ever professor, and we had this really amazing, life-changing, heart-to-heart talk, and he was like, you know, you're pretty good, but I don't think you're loving this. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I didn't, you know, no, it wasn't for me, so I left. And cool. um, yeah, and didn't think I was gonna do anything with that at all. You know, I sort of thought, I, I changed and finished my degree um, and got uh, my, my bachelor's in women's studies. So right, good. Um, good, good, good. Yeah. We can talk about this. And yeah, and a hybrid. And then what did you do with that fabulous degree? That fabulous degree. I finished it, moved to New York. <laughs> I got a degree in political science. That made me really prepared. Yeah, see what we get? Well, liberal arts are a good thing. Yeah. Um, finished the degree, moved to New York. First job, I wanted to work in, you know, in the arts somewhere, in the art world, which I didn't even know was a term back then, but apparently plunged into the art world. Um, my first job was working at the uh, bookstore at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I was completely convinced that that was my, you know, the open, the doors would open and soon enough I'd be the curator of, you know, the impressionist department. I was pretty sure that's how it all worked. Um, Till I realized that everybody else that I worked with had, you know, two PhDs, um, so much education, so smart. They were, you know, amazing people. So um, my second job was happily, um, I was hired to go on an inter or was asked to go on an interview and um, turned out the job, even when I got to the interview, they didn't tell me who I was interviewing with, um, but the job was at Christie's, the auction house. 
And so I got a job there. Yeah. Um, working in the bids and sales records department, which is really just clerical. And then um, some of it's fun. Some of it you stand up next to the auctioneer and um, spot bids in the room and you are, you're in charge of the auctioneer's book. And, you know, those days it was cut and pasted and you pointed out, you know, bids in the room and um, got on the telephone and spent other people's money. That was fun. Um, and then everybody sort of at those entry level jobs tries to pick a specialty and get into a specialty department. And I did. Um, I was hired to be the assistant in the modern and impressionist department. And in those days, Christie's was divided into two, um, two divisions. And Christie's East was on 67th Street. Christie's Park Avenue was on Park Avenue. And Christie's East was sort of everything under $50,000. And so I was in the impressionist and modern department and we were complete, it was the late 80s. It was a big art boom. We were totally overrun with work and with um, consignments. And um, my boss and I were doing, you know, working every Sunday, every night, every Saturday, of course. And eventually I asked, we were, oh, we were getting, we were getting thrown a lot of um, work that was being sort of deaccessioned from collections that had contemporary American post-war work. So we um, formed a tiny little section of our catalog that was contemporary and that grew and grew and grew. And then finally we cleaved the catalog into two and we kept petitioning um, the powers that be mainly um, British men that we should, we're both women, that we should divide the department, I should get contemporary, she would take impressionist. Um, it took three years of trying to convince them, but finally they did in fact give me the department. So I became the specialist in charge of contemporary at Christie's East. Um, and did that for a while. I sort of think that was like um, a graduate school degree. Saw tons of great work, um, worked with clients, laid out catalogs, um, you know, learned a ton. How long did you do that? Like three years? I was the specialist about three and a half years. Yeah. My time at Christie's was about five and change. And then you decided it was about time you put that knowledge to good use or what? No. Uh, no? I, no. I decided I squeezed in a wedding somewhere in the midst of all that. No, why not? Um, decided to move to the suburbs. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Decided to leave Christie's because there is a um, kind of a saying that once you're there for five years, you're a lifer. And yeah. being a lifer is sort of like some kind of condemning, you know, you sort of end up pretty much you work really hard. So pretty much you end up living, breathing and sleeping your job and you get paid very little and your chance of sort of ever, I don't know, having a normal life if you perhaps wanted to get married or have children or anything like that didn't really exist. Um, anyway, I got married and quit my job, planning on um, looking for another job. I quit in June, the auction season's sort of over. Everybody takes off the summer. And, um, and you were uh, living in Manhattan then? Living in Manhattan, yep. Okay. yep. And um, ended up looking for jobs and realizing I was also pregnant. So I did not um, pursue that. And I ended up volunteering at the Museum of Modern Art in the Education Department while I was pregnant, sort of keeping in the world until I had my child. And then to kind of speed ahead, um, I, I just, oh, I moved out to the suburbs where I have the gallery now in Westchester, Larchmont, New York, and um, had our daughter, thought that was it, thought that's what I was doing. And before sort of maybe two years passed and I was very eager to do something with my with my people again, you know, I still was in touch with a lot of artists from art school. Um, I, I really, one reason I left Christie's um, was I was really disenchanted. At the time the art world was, the auction house was selling, you know, selling so much work. It was when the Japanese bought the Van Gogh Iris paintings. It was a real go-go kind of market. And not because, yeah, not because I was so smart, but I left right before it all fell apart. Yeah. And I probably would have been, they, they got rid of, you know, 80% of the experts. It didn't feel very genuine at the time, did it? Yeah, no, it felt really like I could have been, um, you know, trading baseball cards. Oh, or, right. you know, it it's just like it's been pretty much ever since. But it it's, it's really has been. It's really kind of. Um, that was it. Yeah. 
but it, it didn't feel good and it felt like people were buying you know our clients would buy you know racehorses fine wines jewelry and then art was just kind of rounding out their portfolio um so anyway started the gallery really only because i was living in the suburbs had a baby had a house and noticed that no one had real art on their walls and how old was your daughter when you decided to open the gallery? She was three and a half. Three and a half. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what year was the what year was the the gallery born? So I started. Um, I rented. A, what did I do? Let's see. I got a business license. Called it a consulting business. Thought I'd do it part time. Had an office in the house. Back in those days, we all sent around you know slides, and you had to. Yeah, we never projected them. We just looked at them like that. Um, but it was expensive. You have projectors. Yeah, it was expensive. We had a light. I had a light box. Um, anyway, uh, I finally decided that I would take a space outside my house. And when, when, when? I want to know how long you've been doing this. I was. I kind of had the consult. I guess I had my business license for. Must have been about. Ten or eleven months. Um, and then it was sort of like, I'm going to really do this in a serious way or have a second child. So as happens in life, I decided to do it in a very serious way and found out that I was also having a second child. Of course, you did both. So, yeah, because that's what happens. Um, so anyway, decided I had to get out of the house. Um, couldn't have, you know, toddlers banging on the door while trying to have a serious phone call. So um, rented a little space um, from, a, I went around knocking on doors. I didn't have money to fund this. So I knocked on a lot of doors trying to get an empty space from any variety of iterations of stores and ended up in an old auto body um, parts dealership that was defunct and asked the guy if I couldn't rent it for um, two weeks and did a pop-up show um, to raise money to open the first gallery. And, but it wasn't even going to be a gallery. It was going to be an office. It was not meant to be a gallery. How so long ago is this? How old is your second child? 21. Okay. So and the first one's 25. So, um, yeah, you know, baby on the hip, just like one of your yeah. participants was talking about. Um, anyway, got a bunch of artists to... Were you the first person in the world to do a pop-up show? I'm, yes, that was me. That was, that was totally, I get credit for that. No, I don't. Al Gore invented the internet, and you invented the pop-up show. Pop show. Awesome. All right. You guys are both going to be on postage stamps. This is yeah. awesome. Okay. Got all the artwork in there, decided that I had to do this from 5 o'clock until 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, to get it all put together. Because <laughs> yeah. I had two babies at home, right? So I finally called my parents, like, you got to help me. I'm, I'm totally underwater here. And then I got all the art in there, realized that, when I was hanging it, the place just swallowed the work. So they had this kind of... Um, yeah, you did say it was an auto dealership. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it had this kind of pine, I guess it was pine panel, veneer panel. But I thought that would be fine. It seemed neutral enough till I put art on it. And um, anyway, ended up going to the art supply store and buying rolls of white craft paper and a staple gun. And I wallpapered the entire stinking place with white paper, and then hung the show. Um, made some money, opened a little gallery, a little office space that was not supposed to be, uh, I wasn't gonna mount exhibitions, I was simply gonna not have my toddlers banging on the door and you know, have a computer and a phone line. Um, but it became very clear because art is so experiential uh, that I had to have actual pieces in. You know, it was really hard to sell work looking at a slide. And I also was spending, far too much time driving in and out of New York and Brooklyn and trying to do all this in between, you know, pickups from first grade. So um, ended up bringing in work and I was like, well, why isn't it on the wall? So, okay, we'll make a show. So, so you had to have a gallery with a public space pretty early on and you had to go pick up children. So you had to have staff. No staff. What did you do when you went to pick up children? Note on the door. Be right back, school pickup. Okay. So, but the thing is, so my gallery's in Westchester County. It's in the suburbs, right? So the 
there was no brilliant plan that this would be a great place to open a gallery, just that I lived there. It was purely for convenience. And um, everybody else had children. Like really the whole town is just revolves around children. So out on the door, picking up kids. And, and the first space was in a building, the windows faced the train station, but the front, you know, I had this little like sandwich board that I would put out in the morning that said, you know, I was there. Um, so nice. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, and you know, the back, my little office had, you know, um, but there's a history of culture there too. I mean, I can think of Ed Sinden used to have a gallery there. Yeah. And I, Al, I, Alan Brown. Did you know Alan? No, but I knew she was there before me. Do you remember uh, Sue Lawler? She ran Condesso Lawler uh, in Soho when Soho was. I remember the gallery, but not her. So she lived in Larchmont and she was the first, one of the first visitors and she came in and she goes, this will never work here. This, what are you doing? What, what are you showing? And uh, I was well, like, no. my gut reaction too, probably, but it's, you've kicked ass. Yeah, it's not been easy, but... Um, it's getting um, better. I mean, you've, you've got a name now. You've got your own distinct thing going. Okay, yeah. so how did this happen? Just by perseverance. A my, I, I, I long enough that everybody, uh, that you win. To, in, in 2008, when things had gone to crap in the economy and all of that, um, I was in New York having drinks with a girlfriend who's also a painter. And I was bemoaning that I had no money and, you know, it sort of like had cut everything to the bone as, in terms of finances as, as close as I could get. <clears throat> and um, so what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And she said, steely determination. And she texted it to me six times in the train on the way home. And I was like, God, you're making me do this, aren't you? So she, she gets credit or, or whatever for parts of, parts of that. But there's been, you know, it's been, you know, 9-11 was, a, I, after 9-11, I called clients and said, you know, hey, I haven't seen you in a long time. I've got a great show up right now. I want to come on in. And I had my very best client who buys all the time, huge supporter of the gallery. And he said, you know, can he, I'm not, we've made a decision. It's a policy decision, nothing against the gallery, the work, but we're not buying anything for a year. And I, I mean, I was, you know, practically suicidal. No one was buying anything for a year. It was, hard. Uh, it was really hard. Yeah, I had a and gallery. I had a gallery for over 30 years. I closed my gallery in 2004. Um, partially because I changed aesthetics. And how much has your gallery evolved over time? Has your aesthetic, has you, have you honed your aesthetic? Have you altered it? Um, it's probably softened, I would say, if anything. And that's, you know, partly because this is how I make my living. It's the only way I make my living. And so I'm, I need to pay the rent. So I, I think I started out with a little bit. I mean, first thing I started out and I was 27 years old. So I was kind of like, I'm going to show cool art to this sleepy suburban community and they're going to like it. And, you know, they kind of liked it and they kind of, you know, nattered about what's going on over there. And I had, you know, a visit from the police department um, for, <laughs> yeah. for showing a, a painting that was an adolescent uh, from the back, you know, but a, a female adolescent with no shirt on. It was the most sweet, innocent painting. But anyway, um, Child Protective Services or somebody or other showed up and gave me a hard time. Um, but I think that it's, it's not softening necessarily to meet not entirely to meet the, the palette of my collector base, but also it's, you know, as I get older and I get my, you know, I think it just happens by, you know, the edges wear off a little bit. Um, so that's probably happened, I would say. Are most, what's the geography of your demographics of your collectors? Where are most of them from the county or are most of them from all over the U.S.? Um, that's kind of changed also. It used to be much more regional. Yeah. So you know, we're lucky to live in a pocket of, of wealth and yeah. many people who commute in and out of New York. So sort of, I'm in Larchmont, but there's, to name some sort of well-heeled communities around the area, there's um, Scarsdale, Greenwich, Rye, um, uh, Bronxville. Artsville. Uh, 
Yeah, New Rochelle. Lots of lots of people that come in and out of the city that usually, you know, double income, um, advanced degrees, um, double professionals, sort of living in a household together in the suburbs because they're raising children and the school districts are good. Um, so they're pretty sophisticated people. Um, in the last, you know, there's been a lot of ups and downs with um, people trying to sell art on the internet, but I think now there is a little more of a foothold in that. Um, back in, oh God, it was probably a dozen years ago at least, there was a couple of uh, kind of a little internet bubble with selling art, like nextmonet.com was one that was sort of out there for a while. And, um, but now, you know, we, I mean, we've always sold work kind of up and down the East Coast. Um, and I don't really do art fairs anymore, but I did for a while. Um, but now because we're on like namely firstdibs.com, um, we've sold art to Hong Kong, Abu Dhabi, London, you know, Ohio, California, lots and lots of places. It's, it's easy to kind of, you know, let your fingers do the walking. Um, that's interesting. Does the internationality of it make you shift the aesthetic at all, or does it just, or you do it right? And no, I do what I do. It's a, a large portion of, I'll find the word stable, <laughs> is female. Um, why? It's, it's my particular, I mean, just just as I was listening in, you know, earlier this evening about the sort of authenticity in, in art making, I think, you know, when you choose and curate and, and have interest in particular things, it's what's authentic to you. I mean, I think that as a collector, just like as an artist has to find a gallery that they share something with, um, collectors also come to a particular gallery to buy from and they're usually quite loyal to maybe it's three or four galleries, maybe it's two or three, but it's because they like that curator's particular lens um, and, and what they choose. Because we've all, you know, as, as gallerists and curators, we've already pre-selected, if you will, um, things that appeal to us. So if you like what I like, then probably you're going to find something at the gallery that you find interesting. How many square feet is your space? Well, we moved... Um, it's been three years. So I was 13 years in one space um, that was very small. It was, uh, I think it was 525 square feet. And then three years ago, because I was, I don't know what I was thinking, but um, my lease was up and I started casting around for a, a bigger space. Really storage was what I was after. Um, I ended up finding space in the same building that I had always occupied just down the street, which was nice because it's a storefront building in the main walking area of this cute little downtown. Um, so now we have 1,200 square feet up, divided into two exhibition spaces and a back room, and 1,200 down, divided into a private presentation room, and our warehouse is right there. So it's a lot of space now. Um, it's a lot. How, you break down the artists you work with into a couple of few different categories, right? Yeah. I mean, you sort of have represent and something and, and others. Oh, oh, uh, oh, I know what you're referring to. Yeah, not, not visually, yeah, but some of our categories of, yeah, you know, here's the thing. I've tried, I've played with that wording for, I, I mean. Well, just to share the concepts with me. Well, I had, so it's really that. The represented artists are people that we've worked with for a long time. We sell their work all the time, you know, whether it's in a show or just because of their inventory, because really our, our business is probably 75% is what's in the warehouse, which is not on the walls at the moment. Um, so a lot of backroom transactions. Um, so we're trying to, I've been toying with, you know, how do I figure this out? So if you're in the affiliated artist category, either you're in a group show, and I don't know how the relationship's going to progress. So we want to have a presence on the website so we can gauge all of that and, you know, get, and, and put your work out there. Um, and you might, once that group show is over, you might not be in the 
you know, when they go off the list, we might move on to the other list. Might move on, and the represented people are just kind of our our. That's kind of our core stable, um, if you will. Got it. Let's talk about the represented artists. How often do they have an exhibit? It's not really on that, you know, um, old fashioned kind of every 18 months or 24 months cycle. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I would say that everybody gets a solo show. I have, I have too many artists. I have almost 50 between the two categories. So I would say that most of the main people get a show every two, two and a half years, a solo show. How um, often? Go ahead. And there's some people in that category that don't want a solo show. Sure. There's some people that make small drawings um, that we had a very long relationship, but they don't, that's not what they do or want. So how often do you communicate with them and who, who initiates? Well, and what's the attitude? Because we have the bigger space now, um, I have a full-time gallery manager and I've never, up until we moved, it was really almost always me. Just, you know, I was really the, so, but one of her jobs is absolutely artist liaison. Um, so, you know, it's mostly for the big stuff, like we're planning a show, um, there is something that's being loaned to a museum, something like that. Usually I'm talking to them about that. I try to check in, you know, every couple of weeks just so I hear, hear a voice at the end of the phone. Um, but Lonnie, who's our gallery manager, uh, takes care of a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff. Like if something gets sold, she might send the email that says, you know, congratulations, we sold this piece. This is where it's gone. You can put this on your resume. You know, that's stuff I don't necessarily need to do because it usually, when you get on the telephone with someone, it's a long, long conversation. So little stuff she takes care of for me. How, who and how do artist relationships get initiated? And to, uh, do you initiate some and the artist initiate most? Um, I mean, for me, tell me how it's for you. For me, if the artist, if they were more important, it was tended to be me who was going after them. And if they were less important, it tended to be them who was going after me. Yeah, I, I have to say that because my program's really big and I would like it to be smaller, it's not big because I, you know, had some master plan. Um, it's very often my time is limited. I get a lot of artist submissions every day and I look at all of them. I mean, some of them it's very clear that it's not for me. Um, so out of all that I look at, there's a small percentage that I might want to, you know, explore more, more thoroughly. But mostly because I get a lot of submissions, they're either someone that has submitted to me Sometimes, like this happened just recently, a solo show kind of went off the tracks a little bit and the artist didn't make enough paintings that she was, she felt great about. I tell so, the story all the time and I don't think people believe it. Oh my God, it happens all, it happened to me twice this year. See? So, people and it was listen. Not, so then I had to... In, and all the artists who've been in touch with you in the past two weeks have a possibility of getting exposure. It's totally true. If it was if it was two months ago, it might have been too long for you to remember. So you know who got the show? The, it's so funny. This I bet friend, you his name is Mark. <laughs> it's not. Okay. It's, uh, he this guy had come in, you know, to the gallery a couple of times. Um, nice guy, lived locally. I had a studio visit scheduled that week with him. I figured, you know, I should you know, he lives locally. I don't handle local artists in particular, but I thought it was a courtesy to go to a studio. It didn't take me long. So I went to the studio. I literally was standing in the studio looking at the paintings. And I was like, these will work with her paintings. Do you want to have a show? And he was like, when? I said, in 10 days. <laughs> yeah. He's over the moon. He was, it was great. He had tons of paintings. He doesn't show them. They're huge. They looked fantastic with hers. The, sh the, the gallery space looked great. It was, it was really That's a fun... Sweet. Yes, yeah, okay. I don't find that unusual at all, but you know, people do. I mean, that happens, yeah. I'm impressed. You have a, you have one of the highest reputations per square foot of anybody. Oh, thank you. I that's really meaningful to me. I try hard to maintain that. Um, you do. I think something's transitioned for you, though. I mean. You've gone from being a suburban gallery to being some sort of satellite. 
Oh, thank you. But you, um, you feel that? You know, it's funny because I, um, I, I when I, when I, when I leave my little orbit, um, people say, oh, oh, I know your gallery, or I've heard of your gallery, I've been to your website, and I'm always, I'm always still very pleased. Oh, it's not that far. <laughs> yeah, I guess not. It's, uh, but you know, if you, if I were in Chelsea, for example, and it used to be that- Exactly, all that, you'd get a tenth of the attention. Well, well, all my artists used to say to me, like, when are you moving to Chelsea? Come on, you should move. And- Do they say that anymore? No, mm -mm, they never say anymore. No. Nope. See? Yeah, I noticed the same thing. They're they're happy to come to me, and it works. And we we you have, have a really good internet presence. How does it, who do you and your little assistant? The two of you don't just do this. Oh my God! Yes, we do. So the office looks like this usually any given Tuesday. There's myself, Lonnie, and then we have um, a woman named Avery who is there three days a week, and then we have always an intern. Not always, but usually an art history an art history major um, who's interning with us. Who's and invariably a female. Who's, they're all females. I love There's having my... Four, we have four females going so far. Yeah, that's true. Okay, that's so, true. Uh, yeah. Um, and we all do it. You know, like Lonnie loves to Instagram. That's her thing. So I kind of like ask people what they like to do. How long has Lonnie been with you? Uh, two years in August. She sounds really valuable. Uh, she's really great. Um, and, she, you know, she does... The, the problem with working at the gallery, at my gallery in particular, and it's happened to my last gallery manager was there for four years and um, we all get obsessed and you know, I'll catch like, you know, on my laptop, I'll be working any evening because I usually work evenings as well as days. And I'll see a little thing going across saying, you know, 16 files are changed in Dropbox. And I text her, I'm like, are you working right now? Yeah. She should be. But she, you know, we, we all, we, we really like what we do. Um, and we work, it's a little obsessive, but. So what is it for, like for women in the art world? Bad, good, easy, better, different, getting better, always been good, been mediocre, getting, and now it's really good. Getting better, um, it, getting better, um, I think it, you know, it's, it depends on who you are, where you are, what your other things are happening in your life. I mean, so I know you had um, Sharon Loudon on yeah. uh, some time ago. So Sharon and I are friends, and um, she kicked off her book signing tour at my gallery. Cool. And yeah. uh, we had a couple people that uh, that I work with, and she brought some people that were in, also in the book. And um, I was determined to bring someone in who had children, because it's something that I think about a lot, trying to, I mean, anybody who's a working parent would do that. And um, she said, yeah, do it. Bring in an artist who's got kids. Let's hear that perspective too. So I got on the phone and I, <laughs> first two women I called were like, oh, I, I wish I could, but it's an evening and I got this and I got that. I, you know, I can't do it. So the next person I called was uh, David Collins, a painter we'll work with. Um, and uh, he's like, oh, Joe's got basketball tournament. Like, you know, I can't do it either. So it took me four tries and uh, that's hard. And it's not, um, I mean, I think, yeah, kids of artists, um, because the business isn't bound by time and it's not the same as leaving your desk job and coming, you know, coming home at night for dinner and whatever the children's activities, it kind of just bleeds out into the rest of your world. Um, they get used to going to openings and, you know, playing on the studio. I think my floor. kids with me all the time to deliver paintings. Yeah. Oh. You know, and I would tell them, I'd say, you know, kid, I want you to give them a hearty handshake and be able to tell me the color of their eyes when we leave. And I, my, my, young, my youngest son, dad, dad, that woman had one blue eye and one brown eye. <laughs> it's a Picasso. <laughs> my, my son, when he was about uh, 10, this was always a thing we would do. You know, uh, yeah, we're going to go to uh, get pizza later, but just on the way, we're going to yeah, right. this opening. And, you know, he, would, he was a good sport. He didn't mind for a long time. And then one day... We went to this opening and I was like, you know, you're going to like this one. They have cookies. <laughs> and uh, it was like a Sunday afternoon reception. They had music and snacks and whatever. And of course, as always happens, you're going to zip in and zip out. But an hour later, you're still there. And I look over, my son's just standing in the corner with his tongue sticking out at me. I was like, all right, you're, you're maybe getting a little too old to think What's this is What's his attitude about art now? Does he hate it or love it? 
funny story. He's in college now, and um, he rented a house this summer. Um, and in, in uh, oh, I guess he, he got, it doesn't matter. Um, he calls me and he said, so mom, can I, um, can I bring my art to my, to my house, to my room? I was like, what? <laughs> so I always give my kids uh, a small, modest present of art, yeah. like once a year. So when he turned 21, he, he um, well, let me back up. He, I said, no, you can't bring art to your, like, essentially, you know, flop house that you live in. And uh, he's like, you know, my door's locked. It can lock. When we have parties. I lock my door. And he goes, you know, my walls are empty. He goes, frankly, it's embarrassing. <laughs> I had no idea he even cared that we had art. But um, I, for his 21st birthday, I told him he could pick something. And I gave him a budget, of course. And um, he was like my worst nightmare client. He came in. We must have unwrapped 30 things. And, you know, two hours later, I'm like, listen, dude, just decide. Like, I'm out of patience. Like, pick it or don't. And he, he was really... Did he yeah. ask for time after the end? Yeah. <laughs> Can I take 12 yeah. months to pay? He asked for a discount, right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. So, but my sense is that most of the curators are women. Yeah, maybe. And most of the curators, and there's a fair number of other minority curators. And there's a great sensitivity to otherness. Yeah, I would say, I, I think that, um, I mean, I don't want to make a huge blanket statement like, you know. I'm about to. You want me women to are more nurturing or more understanding or more empathetic than, you know, than men I, are. I think that's totally true. And men write the checks and they absolve their souls by writing checks to subsidize these exhibits. But that doesn't necessarily mean they write checks to buy it, to take it home. Yeah. And that the clients you work with, most of the checks are written by men, though women have a role in the decision making. Well, Isn't I think that all true? That, that's all true. It's all 100% true. And, you know, I think one of the things that, so, I mean, there's a few, there's, there's so many directions you could go with that. But so, yes, that's true about collectors. I love when I get a collector and the woman has a big job and she's like a total equal partner because, you know, this is what I, I think, unfortunately, the economics drive this disparity in power. In, in, across the board. And I think that that happens, if you can make that extension to curators and gallerists and, you know, women in business in general, that someone coming into your business might perceive that this business is not your primary income or that perhaps you're married to someone who has another big thing and that this is something you do because you love it. You experience and this personally. I, yeah, absolutely. So, all right, so here's my set. I, you're married. I am married. I have no idea who or what your husband does. Sounds like a, you know, a game show contestant. Um, and <laughs> um, you've done really well with your gallery in the art world and have a significant, solid reputation. Not the highest, but, you know, for as long as you've been at it, it's really high and it could go higher. It's excellent for where it's at. Um, are you perceived as an equal to your husband or is he whatever who it does and who he is because of his maleness have another stature? Okay, so that that question's a little complicated because And loaded. So and loaded, I know. And he's sitting over there, so that's even hi. All right, fine. Um, we'll change the subject. Uh, <laughs> so uh, but but I'll tell you why it's it's a little bit nuanced because when I began the gallery, I was married to someone else. Okay. And uh, we both, we lived in Larchmont. We had a house in Larchmont. And um, it, I mean, to be 100% honest about this, it was not the way that I derived my income. It was secondary income and it was lovely to have. The gallery always paid for itself, um, but it didn't always make enough money that I would live on that money. Right. Um, and then just as luck would have it, um, I mean, it wasn't luck, but it was lots of confluence of all kinds. I wasn't of, asking this question about money per se. But I think that's where, I think that's really the, I mean, that's my. So wait a minute, you think men are more respected than women by society because men make more women, more money than women? Yes, yes. And if we put a price tag on the couple and the woman said, 
I make six million dollars a year and he makes two hundred thousand dollars a year, we would assume the woman is more valuable or more important. Or more or makes more decisions. The man is more important and he just does something more redeeming with himself. Yeah, you know, I think there's there's more and more stay at home dads and there's yeah. lots of time now that um, the woman is sort of the more major breadwinner and sort of outplaying in the larger usually it messes with our biases. What's that? It messes with our biases. It messes with our biases. But I think that um, for, and it's not just, it's not really gallery, but so I live in a small town full of shops that are very sweet and, and there's, you know, a luxury um, home goods store and a beautiful dress shop and they're all owned by women. And I've heard this kind of conversation swirling around this like, oh, well, she doesn't need that job anyway. And I've heard this so, so you think it's women doing it themselves too. Sometimes it, you know, sometimes they, they, I mean, I think that, so just to kind of inform also kind of how the gallery has gone, uh, in 2007, when the economy was going to crap, so was my marriage. And so for the next six years, I was not married and honestly, you know, worked harder than I've worked in my whole life. And I think that, you know, is, is obviously need is very motivating. Um, but it also has helped to, you know, cement the relationship with my artists and the reputation of the gallery. And right. um, yeah, I think it's been great for, for- Let me ask you a last question and then let's open this up to everybody else because I've been going, rambling because you're so damn interesting. <laughs> um, female artists you work with, how many of them? I mean, like, can you say anything about the men artists, girl, female artists, married, unmarried children? role of children in augmenting or impeding their careers? Most of the female artists I work with do not have children. Um, a few do. And um, we have lots of conversations about that because, and how, like, you know, there's kind of this, um, I don't know who made this up exactly, but kind of this rule of thumb that you, your, your career is set back by five years if you have children. And I don't know who made that up, but I hear it all the time, you know, tossed out there. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I know, like, for example, I mentioned before, that's his painting, by the way. David Collins um, is a full-time painter. His wife has sort of a job that uh, makes more money than he does. He's been intimately involved in his children's upbringing. And, um, you know, he juggles. He's He's... You know, he's just as, you know, he and I crack up about, you know, I'm packing art at midnight because, you know, we finished the basketball tournament and then the bake sale and the, you know, then you, you fit it in. It's just, um, it makes it exhausting. Um, I don't think, you guys raised some hands or something, so I know who has things to say. Um, I don't think for artists, money is the driving influence factor force i think leading a full life and maybe having one's art have a legacy i had a great conversation with an artist that i represent and uh he you know talk about making it all work and whatever he had a studio in manhattan for a bunch of years he still keeps a tiny little place but they had a child she's from wisconsin the agreement was that they moved to Wisconsin where she has family and sisters and support and whatever when they have a baby. They said their second baby. So he drives back and forth in a U-Haul and he makes heavy paintings, um, resin and whatever, they're very heavy. Uh, and he makes all these stops. He keeps a little studio in Brooklyn so that he can meet with curators and gallerists and he sleeps on an air mattress on the floor. And um, he was visiting me recently and I sort of said, you know, don't you wish you could keep your your art life and your personal life a little more separate, a little more com car 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 compartmentalized, oh. I found it. Uh, thank you. Just so that you can have a little downtime where your head's clear. And he goes, you know what, I gave that up. I, I just gave it up. I decided that I'm happier when I'm living my art life all the time and I'm just encompassing and just bringing everything together because as you've mentioned many times, that's authentically who he is. So to try to set that, aside makes him creates all kinds of anxiety for him so he has to just say this is it you know this is what i do and 
you know, as his family's come along for the ride. So, and they're, you know. That's cool. I got more questions. I don't see anybody raising their hands. So if you guys want to wave your hand in front of your, oh, look, I got a question. Karen came up with one. And the rest of you are just stunned. What's the deal? Um, Karen, go ahead. I have a question and a comment. Um, which one should I go with first? Whatever you like. One. Go with a comment. Um, yeah, well, you, uh, go with a comment first because after the question, you're giving up the floor. Oh, okay. Uh, well, the comment is um, I'm married. I have a husband who has a well paying job, and I belong to this artist women's group. And whenever I make a comment, most of them have to self, they're self supporting. But if I make a comment about art, it will, and this is among women, they will. Um, yeah, but your husband works, you don't have to work. And it's like, that had nothing to do with the art, but there's some dismissiveness with that, which just frankly pisses me off. Um, but I just wanted to make, throw that out there. I agree. Yeah. Doesn't that suck? That happens all the time. Yeah. yeah. I, just, I, mean, I don't know what to say. I would just go, well, that's bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know I what else to say. Right. That might not be the right response. <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm just kind of like, uh, I don't know how to deal with that. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then um, you mentioned that uh, most of the women you work with don't have children. Um, like Heather, I, my mother just passed away from dementia um, and I've been her caregiver for 10 years. And um, I was curious if you had artists who had worked in that capacity. They didn't have children, but they had kind of to set their career aside while they dealt with parents. Yeah, I'm sorry about your mother. That's really hard. My my mother took care of her mother and I in the, the house that I grew up in and it was incredibly time consuming and emotionally draining. Um, yeah, I have one artist whose father is, you know, crazy and drinking himself to death and uh, um, doesn't live in New York where she lives. So she's back and forth a lot. And um, it's not the same as doing it every day. But it's it's, you know, she has to, you have to give yourself mental breaks because you can't, I mean, sometimes maybe your break is making art. Maybe it's just, you know, sleeping. Like you have to, you know, be kind to yourself. And in, in regard to uh, the comment about, yeah, your husband works. And, you know, I, I had that as a, as a gallerist too. Like, oh, you don't, you don't need to, you know, I used to have this uh, engagement ring, big, you know, big diamond ring. And uh, I stopped wearing it to studio visits and to meetings because I hated that perception so much that people would just dismiss it as, well, you know, that's nice that you can have a gallery and you don't have to look hot or something. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. I think it's an interesting question for an artist, whether they want to gallery, because some galleries have directors or are owned by people who do not need to make money. That, 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 that does exist besides being a perception. And I think for an artist, it's important to ask whether you want, you know, some art galleries, they love you and have no need to sell your art so that they can, ha you know, there's a lot of artists they work with and you don't get very much attention. Or there's another art gallery that, for the gallery to stay afloat and the people who run the gallery to make a living have to make money on your art, which to another extent determines the nature of the relationship. Um, it's something to consider. I think, you know, I, I believe, and I think Kenise agrees, that it's a relationship of equals. It's not like you get married and you say, and I don't think this is the guy to getting married. If you just have me, my life will be solved. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that when, you know, an artist says, if I, if I just find a gallery, everything is solved. Mm -hmm. um, it, you're just swapping for a different set of problems and giving up a percentage, which is part of it. Um, I argue, I would say for most folks, it's a really good idea, but not necessarily, but it's still a relationship and relationships are significantly important. And I can talk about that if I don't see anybody asking a question. Who's got a question? Jen, thank you. Go ahead, Jen. Yeah, I'm just wondering what, for her gallery, if, um, Kenise, what, what percentage of your work with your artists is focused on like career building versus sales of their work? And like, do you, do you find that artists are, that you're working with are concerned more about sales or about career building? I think it's, um, 
I think it's, it, you know, it shifts feet sometimes, but it's, um, I think it's 50-50. Um, I mean, just to go back for a moment to what Paul says, I think a useful way to look at um, the, the commission, you know, giving up 50% to the gallery for what they do for you. I, I sort of tried to think about that differently, that the artist is paying this team of people a commission. So, other than, so we're not really paying you, you a commission, you're paying us a commission for doing something for you. And that something should be a lot. I mean, really, in addition to having the walls and the insurance and the staff to talk about your work, you know, the staff should be able to talk about it and know your resume and find people that it's a good fit for. I and mean, we keep copious notes and lists on people's cards in our address book. You know, what do they like? Who do they know? Are they on a board of a museum? You know, can we possibly ask them to facilitate a donation? I mean, there's, it's, it's kind of always multifaceted. Um, and then sometimes, you know, like I have an artist who, he and his wife just bought a house and they gutted it. And his dream was they were living in Brooklyn for a long time. They had a studio and a house and an apartment and blah, blah, blah. Um, and they sold it all and they wanted to build the studio and got this house. And uh, he's like, you guys sell some work. I was like, all right, let's do this. So, you know, this was kind of a joke between us. We're like, all right, what do you got? We need a new roof, we need plumbing. Like, let's, what can we put together? So at that moment, it was all about a check. Um, other times, you know, we have artists that their works may be a little, so I do a lot of curating outside, not a lot. I do, I have at different times concentrated on curating um, at places outside of my gallery. And then I can show work that's slightly more ephemeral or edgier or not necessarily kind of made for residential collections. And then it's about where can, where can go from here? You know, where can we, whose eyes, what curators, what museum directors can we get to look at this and how are we gonna make that happen? Um, day to day, it's, I mean, it's a storefront gallery. And um, so day to day, it's more probably about talking about the work to get sales happening. Um, but there's always that umbrella of what can we do more? Cool. Thank you. Cool. Thank you too. Who else has a question? Heather, go ahead. Now we'll go to Steve. Go ahead, Heather. Okay. Hey, Kenise. Um, hi. Uh, I, I did a commission recently last year and, um, it, it was great, and I, I think the work looked great. I made it my own, but they had really specific requirements for their office. It was a lawyer's office, and they didn't like my regular work. It was too edgy and confrontational or too dark or something. So when, when you have clients, how, how, what do they come with of their own expectations, and are you able to change those, or how do you, you know, what's that kind of balance like? Um, well, let me ask you a question about the commission. How did they discover your work? Was it through a gallery or through you personally? Um, I'd met the, the, the guy who was arranging the commission. He'd seen my work some years before at a, at a nonprofit space. So he had seen work, but then he wanted to change it. <laughs> well, he said because he saw that I made work that uh, dealt with my surroundings. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I ended up... Mm -hmm. So... I hate commissions. I just hate them. And they, they're always fraught. I mean, we, we do them. Um, I, I basically tell people, you know, if you don't already own the artist's work or haven't seen it a lot, we, we just can't go down this, this road. If it's because you like this person's work and you need something expansive because it's for maybe a, a boardroom or, you know, we do a lot with um, the hospitality industry. We've done a lot of uh, work with hospitals. So, you know, maybe you need it to be um, uh, behind plexi and bigger and able to be washed down. Then we can kind of go from there. But I, I, and this is earlier in my career, we had a lot of commissions that were like, you know, this woman brought in her pottery barn candle and says, it has to be exactly this color. I was like, this is terrible. And, and they, and, you know, there's really nothing worse than seeing a disappointed patron's face. And then you also, then you've got to call the artist again and say like, it's still not there. And it just, it's, it's sort of like an artist in their studio makes something for you to love every day. Can't you just pick something that's there 
Um, right. The right. scale is hard, but if it's, you know, it's I'd rather, you know, kind of continually go back to the studio until the painting they want is there, um, yeah. than go down the other way. The problem, I, I mean, I commissioned a portrait once to a woman I was married to. Um, I mean, of us. And you're dealing with the client, our expectations, and, you, and you're trying to guess what those are, and we don't know, but you missed. And, mm -hmm. and when you make a painting and it's a done deal, then it's about my agreement with the painting, and your challenge isn't part of it. I think doing commission, it can be great, but it's got to be spelled out pretty, pretty clearly. You know, public public commissions. So, like a lot of the artists I work with have gotten MTA Arts for Transit commissions. The New York uh, City subway system um, and light rail system does really amazing projects. You can there's an app for that. You can go on and look at all of that stuff. And so, a lot of the artists have been hired for these permanent public commissions, and those are amazing because they get to really stretch and figure out fabrication, and and those are great projects. But you know, just like Sometimes building a corporate collection when there's 10 people on board that are all telling you like, you know, well, I don't like pink and that's got, you know, political content and that's got, I see, you know, is that, is that a breast there? Like it ends up that you get nothing in the end. So you, you don't have any of that um, authenticity that was, that the artist might have in any painting that they in, endeavor, they embark on. Yeah, but at the same time, it can be really cool for an artist to rise to the challenge. But the other part that was being asked of the question, Kenise, was about how do you steer a client collector's taste? And my sense is it's much more about education and yeah. speaking agreement. And then I guess, you know, if you're enthusiastic, they, like a teacher, they tend to pick up on your enthusiasm. And most collectors, my experience was, are comfortable working with four or fewer galleries. And if you have their ear and they appreciate your enthusiasm, but that doesn't mean you can take them from nothing to let's buy this painting in 10 minutes. It might be 18 months. Right. And it's just like, you know, appreciating music or an author, you know, sometimes, and, and I love when a collector collects in depth, you know, they'll buy something from me 10 years ago and come back and buy something five years later and, and yesterday, because then they're really understanding what the artist is about. Um, you know, sometimes introducing them to the artist is a, is a gift. Sometimes it backfires, um, you know, personalities are personalities and it's not always a match. Um, but we try to give them as much education as possible. We never, you know, we never send an image without also sending a statement and a resume and like, you know, whatever kind of material people now have videos and, you know, all kinds of things. So we try to send as much supplemental material as possible. Um, and it, I, I find that people like that because this is a thing we call, you know, the cocktail party conversation. So I buy this painting, I'm crazy about it, and I understand it. Like I've spoken to the gallerist in person and, and maybe met the artist and I know a lot about their work. But my friends come to my house and I'm having a dinner party and they say, what's the, what's the painting on the wall, what's it about? And now you've got the tools to talk about it also. It makes you feel educated and, and informed and you can pass that on. So we kind of, you know, we make them the, the ambassador for the artist also. Yeah, that, that sounds, sounds really good. It also sounds, I don't know, am I being sexist? It sounds really feminine. Does it? Damn. You know, it's very nurturing. Oh. I would yeah. be much more matter of fact about it. I think it's really wise. You don't, you, you don't, you don't find that a compliment? I do, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't, I, I think um, my feminine attributes have helped me more than they've hindered me in business. I would think now so. I would think if one were mature in the 30s, it would be, could easily be a problem. Um, it's a changing game. All right, cool. Um, who else has got a question? Anybody? Hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. Oh, Steve, look at that. I didn't, well, I did forget, actually. Um, go ahead, Steve. Hi. I, uh, I guess I just had a question about the, the the kind of the two lists that you have and kind of a sidebar question on that is how how often do you kind of replace artists on your gallery artists lists 
Oh, you know, how long do they stay on your list? And, you know, what's the sort of, the, the, how do they, you know, is it based on sales that they drop off the list? Or is it, you know, are you you're sort of, you, you mentioned that you have too many artists on your, uh, your gallery artists. And I was amazed at your comment that maybe you've got 75% of their work is in storage. Yeah, um, well, 75% of, uh, I, I think it's not so much 75% of their work is in storage. It's that, well, I guess that does equate to the same thing. Yes, our, the sales that we have are, are 75% from what we show people in the warehouse. But that sort of means that when we take collectors, say they don't care for what's in the front room, we'll take them and say, well, what do you, you know, what do you, what do you think you like? You're looking for color, you're looking for this. Let's go downstairs and unwrap art and look at other things. Um, in terms of the list, the reason I have so many artists is because I don't have the heart to not have them, um, <laughs> which is not really a good reason. Um, <laughs> what happens is, you know, someone's in a group show and I really, I, I mean, let me just say that I really like all the artists that I work with and I wouldn't work with them if I didn't. Um, Cause there's also that, you know, there's sort of the work is the work, but also if you're easy to work with and professional and show up on time and get your paperwork in and, you know, all of the things that make you a good partner um, that, you know, and if you don't sell anything and you continue not to sell anything, so it just goes on for years and you're still, you're still in, you're still, you know, you're still, and then there's people that, and, and it happens not all the time, but it's sort of happening right now. So it feels um, very fresh. Like there's an artist I've worked with for eight years. I love her. I love her work. We've sold two things in eight years. Like I, I just can't, can't, and she knows it. Like we, we kind of dance around this a little bit in kind of a joking way, but we can't, you know, it doesn't make sense to continue. And sometimes when you um, have that shift in energy, you know, you move something, then it's good for everybody. Like it's not necessarily a breakup. It could just be that, you know, I anticipate that we will be friends. I mean, I go to her house um, for social things also. Um, and that friendship was built through the gallery and, and that, um, I mean, sometimes it's not, it's not a rejection as much as it's sort of a freeing. So I try to put that out well, there. Yeah, I mean, that's a good, uh, so it goes against my previous comment about nourishing. So it's good to see that there is nourishment amongst gallerists. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think most people, once you just, I think, I hear this all the time from artists that getting a gallery is so hard and people work so hard at it, but I think really people are people. And if you click with someone and they like the work, I mean, it has to be a, it has to be a package, then, um, you know, people are, are I've, my, my experience is that people are generally good and kind hearted and um, it works for me. So. Yeah. Thank you. I'll have to stop by because I'm only a hundred miles away. Oh, perfect. <laughs> right next door. Karen. Go ahead. Um, Knace, you said that you got several emails a day um, submitting art. And is it appropriate, in your opinion, to say I submit, you know, to a gallery and I don't expect them to show me or be interested, but is it appropriate to ask if they would recommend a gallery whose work they felt like, or they may know a gallery where my work might be more suitable than yours, for instance, or that was oh, a really inappropriate question, but um, hopefully I got my question in there. So I'll answer it in two ways uh, or two parts, um, and neither is great. So firstly, submitting to a gallery that you don't think will show your work or has any interest in your work is simply a waste of time. Um, I didn't mean that as much as maybe, you know, I don't want to presume that they would, they'll like it. I mean, I think there's a, a, that they might be interested, but I don't want to presume that they'll be interested, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I've, I mean, we get, you know, of course, because, because we're together all the time, my little office staff and I, like, sometimes we laugh at artist submissions because they're really silly. And they have funny wording or something. And, um, but, you know, the, the best, you know, or they'll be very flamboyant or something, but, you know, um, I do get submissions that feel like you're just whistling in the wind. 
Like it's not directed to anyone in particular. It's not work even remotely similar to what I show. It's, um, I, I think just, it's a lot like dating, and it's kind of like if you're interested in guys, it's like submitting your images to an all-girl website. Yeah. Um, and yeah. sometimes, you know, people should do some research. But, Karen, this is something specifically that we'll talk about at length in two weeks. So, okay. and I have, I, have, I have ideas. Good. Thank yeah. you. And, and I do get that question about, you know, where might I turn – um, and frankly, I mean, I like to, you know, work with people and educate them, but I don't have time for that. Like, it also puts, puts me in a position, then, then they write to the next gallerist and says, you know, dear, dear Paul, Kenise Barnes says, you know, you might like my work. And I'm like, hold on, we have to be very careful. Everybody has to be careful with, you know, their sort of endorsements and, and your professional network. So, you, you know, it's not, it's not something you can really, you know, there are, there are, there are venues for that. There are places to find out those networking things, but um, to ask a gallery to do that is not appropriate. Thank you. Cool. Did, Karen, did you have another question or was that it? That was it. Okay. Thank you. Um, we could wrap this up or I could take another question or two, but we might be, who else? Wait a minute, Carolyn, I see you. Anybody else that hasn't spoken tonight? Dun, 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 dun. Donna, so let's go to Karen first. I mean, Carolyn first, and then Donna, and then we're gonna wrap it up. Carolyn, go ahead. Okay, this is just a comment. Um, I had enough time to take a quick look at your website and, uh, <laughs> It's great. You can okay. really look at it. You can look at all the art. You can see it in homes, I believe. I don't know what homes, but you can see it uh, displayed in a gallery, displayed in a home, and all the varieties, and each artist is isolated. And that's very helpful because if you're an artist and you want to show so many websites that go on, and I'm looking for some galleries in the States now, um, I can't get that clear information. I just see shows. So it's just a comment to say that it was really uh, enjoyable and from someone in the West Coast of Canada, it was nice to walk through your gallery and, and see what you're doing, firing. That, that's something we, we really try hard, you know, whenever we think of something, like, hey, that looked great. We lent, we lent that painting to um, a designer showcase, but didn't it look great? So let's put that picture up so people can see in context what it really looks like. Or we're often taking pictures you know, well, we move the office furniture around, We're like, you know, let's put that desk in front of that painting because this client wants to see the painting, but they've already seen what the actual painting looks like. But let's show them that it has depth and what the scale is. It's, it's just always trying to, you know, make, make, make it better, make it uh, more user-friendly. I have one, one other little question then to ask you, because I was just thinking how great your website looks, but the artist has a website and the art, artist websites are usually pretty pure. They've got a collection of art and, and, and usually during a gallery, you take it. You don't tend to take it in a home setting or in a commercial setting. Would that be a good idea? I think, it's, seen art? Yeah. I think it's great. You know, I've given a bunch of professional workshops and um, we always start by taking a look at the artist's webpage and you'd be surprised at how many people, because it's yours, you know, you just, you know, in your mind's eye what, what it looks like. And so there's sometimes just no dimensions, sometimes just no materials. Um, and, and we have people come in. So all those things are helpful. But also we have people come in with a show postcard. And it clearly says this painting is 20 by 24. And they come in saying, I'm looking for this painting over my sofa. And you're like, wait, you want to painting this painting small because you know you just kind of want what you want you put it in your mind in a certain way and um it, it helps the context even if you have measurements um i think it helps it helps our clients they like it i think it helps but i think for an artist it's a different issue and i think rather than showing art in your home carolyn which i think would look or uh, i think it looks too commercial i think to show some of it in your studio makes a lot of more sense and the yeah. studio gives people information oh, that's yeah. valuable okay and a chair or something gives them scale. When I would reproduce art uh, for posters and announcements, I would frequently leave an electric outlet in the image because the electric outlet would tell people how big it was without having to look at the dimensions. Oh, that's a good idea. Okay. So rather than to actually 
put it in a setting. Where you could. You can you could do that also because a lot of people don't see the electrical outlet. Okay. <laughs> well, that's helpful. Thank you. Sure thing. Um, Donna, I believe you are our last contestant. Take it away. Hi. Hi, Kines. Hi. Um, loving this webinar. It's fantastic. I love the artwork behind you. So um, one of my questions is who made that because it's gorgeous. So that's by David Collins. He's um, a painter who lives in New York and, uh, and actually he just moved out to Quag, which is in Long Island. Um, but he went to RISD, he was a painting and a printmaking major. And David um, is the artist I've worked with for the longest of anyone in my program. And he has been in my program for the entire time. So- I was gonna ask about that, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's stunning. Um, the other question I have is, um, are all your artists from the United States? I haven't had a chance to check out your website yet, but I could probably find that out there. But are they all from the United States? Um, they mostly, they're not all from the US, but most of them live there now. Like we have two Cuban born artists that live in Miami. Um, it's funny because I contacted an artist who I was interested in, in Australia, and um, she wrote back the funniest email. She says, I don't know why you're interested in my paintings. Aren't there enough artists in New York? And I, was, <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, but, um, and I think Paul touched on this before, that people, do, getting the robot? Yeah. I know, people really do like what seems exotic to them. So I know you said you were in Bali. It's sort of, yeah, if you're, you know, if you're in New York, you might love something that's Swedish or, you know, I don't know, Hawaiian or, or French or something that's interesting. Or Balinesian or, or Martian. Yep, Martian. <laughs> and we're ready. Yeah, the only problem I can think of there is actually transporting all the works, shipping all the works, you know, and kind of organizing that. But aside from that, yeah. Yeah, the okay, shipping the shipping's tough. But it, you I mean, know something, you know, Donna, that is a great reason to get in touch with Ashley Bickerton and find out about how he ships. Does he ship by air? He must. But it's not, error isn't mandatory. And maybe you want to make your art, you know, conform to shipping constraints to an extent. All right. Um, I think we've gone on long enough. Wait a minute, Karen, your hand is up. Do you want to say something, Karen? Go ahead. No, I just uh, had to take the dog out and somehow got my hand raised. Sorry. Awesome. <laughs> Fabulous. Perfect conclusion. Um, <laughs> me. All right, Kenise, this has been super informative and really valuable, and you are very human, and I appreciate all the valuable information you have shared with us. Let me unmute everybody so we can all together say thank you. Everybody's unmuted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Bye. Bye. Good night, yeah. everybody. See you next Good night. week. Good night. Good night. Good night. I'm going to look at the schedule. Good idea. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a blessed evening or day wherever you